It's part six, page 160. We were just speaking of the uh, fingernail. I love the actual definition of what is a fingernail, and I actually test you on this, so um, it's wonderful. A nail is a scale-like modification of the epidermis that forms a clear protective covering on the dorsal surface of the distal part of a finger or toe. <laughs> And I just think that that's uh, wonderfully um, <laughs> erudite in its own way. So um, uh, fingernails and toenails are useful. Sometimes we use them as tools. Probably not a good idea. Uh, they're not hooves. And uh, they're not really... We should actually use tools that we make uh, in our manufacturing and try to avoid using our fingernails as well as our teeth as tools. Um, we make this mistake on a regular basis. So um, we do have adequate uh, tool making uh, abilities and tools around the house for doing what we need to do. So just uh, <laughs> a little heads up there. So um, one of the reasons you might notice that I've drawn a little circle right here. And um, the reason I did that is to remind me to mention to you that um, I was moving the cadaver on its gurney out of the cadaver room one day. Uh, to uh, do a demonstration uh, with the students and for the students. And uh, I was moving quickly because, uh, as always, we have a very limited amount of time to do everything. And I wasn't watching as carefully as I should watch. And uh, the, um, the gurney was moving at some significant speed with weight, and it caught my thumb uh, at the door jam. And it... Uh, <laughs> So I actually got a black and blue thumb, and it hurt like crazy. And the normal thing to do, of course, uh, when things hurt, uh, because uh, pain is stasis. It's, you know, the buildup of blood. Blood has nowhere to go. And so our receptors um, basically uh, fire off. Anyways, um, I couldn't actually create a hole in my, because uh, I don't have electrosurgery tools or anything like that. But I do keep uh, acupuncture needles, uh, fairly sturdy ones sometimes, uh, close at hand. Um, and I pulled them out of my bag, and I tried to uh, penetrate here with that needle, and then I, I realized, oh, it's too thick. And I went further and further back. I eventually went right about here uh, with my thumb, and I eventually sort of got to this spot right here where I was able to poke through. And I uh, sort of like, I remember getting sort of, I pushed, pushed, and then I finally got to that spot where I could actually penetrate completely all the way through, boink, like that. And uh, when I did that, there was this fountain of blood that <laughs> spurted up about 12 or 15 inches high, and the students all went, whoa. Um, so that was a little bit of excitement, briefly. But the pain went right away. And uh, because I had relieved the pressure, I had and about an hour or two later, I had to do it again, but there was no fountain the second time. But what I noticed over time was that the nail grew out and that hole that I had produced probably way back here somewhere uh, with the, uh, the needle um, was still present. That hole was still present and it was working its way out and I could actually watch the uh, speed at which nails grow. So that was sort of interesting. Okay, so a little story to add to the excitement here. So um, what else do we need to know here about um, the skin is uh, sweat glands. Sweat glands are very important. And uh, so they're sometimes referred to as uh, sudoriferous glands. And uh, we're producing a certain amount of watery output, the idea being that we can cool ourselves with the watery output. Okay. So that's the idea here is sweat glands. And uh, we are the naked ape. We are actually designed for um, running and moving about in our environment. We're a very aerobic animal. And uh, we have uh, Achilles tendons to prove it. We have uh, arches that um, push up from the bottoms of our feet to prove it and make us uh, really good at, at running. Uh, we're a very erect species. Uh, we also have a nuchal ligament at the neck that we'll be talking about. So we're actually well adapted to running. We're persistent runners, not all that fast, but 
we're fast over a long, we're kind of fast if you were to consider a 100 mile run. So there are no horses that can run as, fa as fast as a human across 100 miles. Horses are good at short distances, uh, but there are actually uh, <laughs> well-documented races called the Western States and other races uh, that are 100 miles in length, and uh, humans can do those races. Um, occasionally a horse can do it in 24 hours. Humans can do it in um, as little as 16 or 17 hours. So humans are ridiculously fast across 100 miles compared to horses. Uh, that's an important detail because historically uh, the earliest uh, individuals uh, were thought to be uh, able to run down deer and antelope and that sort of thing and there seems to be some stories within the um, how shall I say first uh, first nation communities that discuss that um, and there is evidence from biological science that we can we can do that so at any rate the, why do I bring that up I bring that up because we are the naked apes that sweat really well uh, males sweat better than females and it gives them actually an advantage in distance running uh, some females are still rather good at distance running because uh, they're presenting with less bone matrix and uh, so their uh, body habitus allows them to travel distance with less weight and uh, weight makes a difference uh, over the long run. And so while males can cool their bodies considerably better than females can cool their bodies, females tend to be on average a little bit lighter uh, due to differences in bone matrix. So um, another detail here that uh, you might want to be aware of as clinicians is that males are producing more sweat by their teenage years than our females. And uh, so there's going to be, how shall I say, issues with that, uh, a variety of issues that you can only imagine. So I'll leave it at that, and we'll talk about that from time to time. But um, things like whiteheads and blackheads and that sort of thing are characteristic of glandular output. Okay, so sweat glands cools you off. Um, then we have these uh, special uh, sweat glands over here, um, also engaged in that process of producing sweat. Are far more numerous, are um, uh, more abundant uh, in the palms, the soles of the feet, um, the forehead. Um, oftentimes, if you're um, literally sweating something, that is to say worried about it, you know that you're, and you're nervous uh, that your feet are getting sweaty, your hands getting sweaty, your forehead's getting sweaty um, when you're feverishly working at something. So there's that type of uh, sweat. So there's the sweat that cools you, there's the sweat that um, responds to um, stimuli of the sympathetic nervous system. So all of that. Um, you can often uh, smell what's going on with an individual's diet, um, whether it's urea because they're big meat eaters or because they have coffee or even in some cases because they've had alcohol. So there are certain things that uh, are flowing with the sweat. Uh, we have apocrine sweat, sweat glands. It says we have about 2,000 of those. They're uh, positioned um, at the axilla and the armpit or at the uh, perineum uh, between the legs. The uh, type of output there is much uh, more inclusive of other ingredients besides watery types of sweat. And so we have uh, sweat that includes uh, fatty substances and proteins and so on. Um, and because of the complex nature of this, uh, it even has a milky or a yellowish color to it that um, bacteria can thrive on this. And so while initially there's no odor whatsoever from the output of this particular uh, gland, it very quickly takes on odor uh, and a musky smell because uh, bacteria thrive, as noted on that. We have special glands in the ears uh, that produce a, ser a cerumen, and as noted, males, especially above the waistline, are more intense in their connective tissue outputs as well as their skin outputs. So males will have big shoulders, uh, more bone matrix in the upper half of the body than do females. And uh, there's consequences with that. And in this case, uh, the ears will be producing much more uh, output from the ceruminous glands. Uh, we sometimes call it earwax. 
Okay, so uh, it's literally called cerumen. And uh, sometimes they need to be cleared of that. Uh, then we have mammary glands. Mammary glands that secrete milk are actually a kind of uh, gland that is um, a sweat gland that's been readapted uh, for the use of milk production. And so that's kind of an interesting little detail right there.